Hey folks, welcome back. This is the third video in the series on causal effects. In the last video, we learned how to estimate causal effects with observational data via something called a propensity score. While these approaches help us in the face of measured confounders, there's still the problem of unmeasured confounders. In other words, variables that bias our estimate that we do not observe in our data. In this video, we will see how we can resolve this problem of unmeasured confounders. To do this, we we'll need to reevaluate how we think about causal effects. So with that, let's get into it. Everything I'm going to talk about in this video concerns connecting observational data to interventional data. In other words, connecting data that we might passively observe to data that we might measure more carefully through a randomized controlled trial or something similar. And so this distinction between observational studies and interventional studies was made in the previous video, but just as a quick recap of what what we're talking about here, say we're trying to quantify the causal effect of a pill on headache status. What a observational study would look like to investigate this is we passively observe a population of people with headaches. Some of them take the pill, some of them don't take the pill, and we just observe their natural outcomes with no intervention or influence on who takes the pill and who doesn't. On the other side of this, we have an interventional study, which is more akin to a randomized controlled trial where we carefully pick a population of people at random and then randomly split them into two groups, an experimental group and a control group. We give the experimental group the pill and we don't give the pill to the control group and then we can compare their outcomes. So clearly observational data take less effort to measure while interventional data take more effort to measure. But as has been said in the past, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So even though observational data are easier to capture, it takes more effort to estimate causal effects from them, and even still, it may not be possible to estimate causal effects from them. We saw one way we can estimate causal effects from observational data in the previous video where we talked about propensity scores. And in this video, we're going to talk about an alternative strategy to doing this. And so first, we're going to take a step back and reevaluate our definition of the average treatment effect, which is what we've been using to quantify causal effects in this series. Formula one here is how we define the average treatment effect in the context of a randomized controlled trial. So what we have is this expression here and just quickly running through this, E is denoting the expectation value, Y denotes the outcome variable, X denotes the binary treatment variable, X equals one means the subject took the pill, X equals zero means the subject didn't take the pill. So this first term is the expected outcome of the treated group because all these people took the pill. The second term is the expected outcome of the untreated group because they didn't take the pill. So this is a very simple expression. And if we have a randomized control trial, we can obtain the average treatment effect in a very straightforward way. But there's an implicit assumption here that people may not realize if just seeing this equation on paper or on a website or something. So the assumption is that the treatment status is statistically independent of all other factors. So that's why this equation is true for a randomized controlled trial. That's the whole point of randomization so that who is in the experimental group and who is in the control group has no statistical relationship with any other factors. But now we're going to look at an alternative way to formulate the average treatment effect. And to do this, we're going to use the do operator, which we first saw in the previous video on causal inference. So here we have a very similar thing. We have this expected outcome of the treated group and we have the expected outcome of the control group. But the only difference here is we now have this do operator in each expression. What the do operator represents is a physical intervention. As opposed to on this side in formula one, this notation does not distinguish between a intervention and just a passive observation. And so what we gain by expressing the average treatment effect in this way is that we are explicitly denoting that the treatment status is statistically independent of all other factors. And so in the context of a randomized controlled trial, these two formulas are equivalent, but this isn't true in other situations. In other words, in an observational study, if you use this equation without being careful about statistical dependencies, you're likely gonna get biased 
estimates of causal effects because there are likely systematic differences between the people that received the treatment and people that didn't receive the treatment. Okay, and then as a final note, in the previous video, we talked about these propensity score-based methods, and there we were using this equation and we were using observational data. So there, the implicit assumption is that the propensity score-based methods approximately remove the statistical dependence between treatment variables and measured covariates. So that's what allows the propensity score-based methods to work, is that we're taking care of these other statistical dependencies. Okay, so more on this do operator. So the do operator, again, is a way to denote interventions. And so this brings up another observational interventional distinction. On the left here, we have an observational distribution. So this is what we saw on the left-hand side of the previous slide. In other words, this is what we saw in Formula 1. It was the probability of y given the variable x is observed to be x naught. While in Formula 2, we had an interventional distribution. So that was the probability of y given the variable x is artificially set to x naught. I talk more about the do operator in the video and causal inference, so check that out. Also, this is a very good reference. This is an introduction by Judea Pearl, who invented the do operator, and it's a big figure in the space of causal inference. So often we don't measure interventional distributions directly. So what this would look like is doing the interventional study, doing the randomized controlled trial. In other words, doing the physical intervention and capturing the statistics. However, Formula 2, this alternative definition of the average treatment effect, relies on the interventional distribution. So if we want to use this more general formula for the average treatment effect, one that's not just true in randomized controlled trials, but is true everywhere, it would be good if we can translate any interventional distribution into observational distribution. So translating the thing that we want to estimate in terms of things that we actually measure. And that brings up the question of identifiability. And so identifiability is all about answering the following question. Can the interventional distributions be obtained from the given data? So in the context of a randomized controlled trial, we like already have the interventional distribution because that's what we painstakingly went through the process of measuring. But in all other cases where we just have observational data, what identifiability is all about is expressing the interventional distribution in terms of observational distributions. And so Pearl and colleagues developed a systematic three-step process for answering this question of identifiability. Okay, so the first step in this three-step process is to write down the causal model. And so taking the example from the previous video where we were estimating the causal effect of going to grad school on income, this was the causal model that we had assumed. Age causes grad school and income, then grad school causes income. Then the second step is to evaluate something called the Markov condition. And so this consists of two parts. The first is asking, is the graph acyclic? So basically, do any any cycles exist in this graph. So if we start at Z and we follow the arrowheads, there's no way we can get back to Z. If we start at X, we follow arrowheads, there's no way to get back to X. And if we start at Y, there's no way to get back to Y. So indeed, this graph is acyclic. The second part is that all noise terms are independent. So basically, the noise terms for age would be all factors that cause age that are not captured in our causal model. Similarly, the noise terms for grad school would be all other factors other than age that drive someone's probability of going to grad school. And then the noise terms of income would be all other factors other than age and grad school that have a causal effect on someone's income. And so assuming that these noise terms are independent means that there's no cross connections between these external factors. Is this true in this case? That is questionable, but for the sake of this example, we'll just assume that it is. Okay, and finally, step three, we express the interventional distribution in terms of observational distributions. And so we can do this using the wonderful truncated factorization formula, which expresses any interventional distribution in terms of observational distribution. So notice we have a do operator on the left-hand side, and there's no do operator on the right-hand 
right-hand side. Okay, but still on the left-hand side, we have Z, and to estimate the causal effect of X on Y, we just want to isolate Y in this conditional probability here. So the way we can get rid of Z is by summing over it. So basically setting Z equal to every value in our data set. So Z goes one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to, you know, 100, whatever we might have, and then just evaluating this summation. Okay, so now that we have the interventional distribution in terms of observational ones, we can compute the average treatment effect using our formula two from before. And so all we do is just plug in one here, stick it over here, plug in zero here, stick it over here, and then just compute the average treatment effect. And so the truncated factorization model I showed in the previous slide was just for that specific example, but it's a much more general formula as you can see here. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but this is from the introduction by Pearl. And I also talk a bit more about this in the blog associated with this video. So now the whole motivation of this video from the propensity score video was that propensity score based methods don't account for unmeasured confounders. They only handle confounders or covariates that are included in our data. So what can we do about unmeasured confounders? So using everything that we've talked about in this video, we can compute the average treatment effect even when we have data missing from our data set. So we're gonna run through this systematic three-step process again, but now for a more complicated example. So this is taken from the introduction by Pearl. So suppose we have this causal model. We have our treatment X, our outcome Y, and we have three covariates. Okay, so step two is we evaluate the Markov condition. We can see that this graph is acyclic. There are no cycles. And we will just assume that the noise terms are independent. And then step three, we will express the interventional distribution. So again, we do this using the truncated factorization formula, which is a lot longer now because we have five variables instead of three. And then to isolate Y on the left-hand side, we can just sum over covariates. But now suppose that Z isn't measured. It's missing from our data set. We can run through the same process again, we write down the causal model, we evaluate the Markov condition, we express the interventional distribution first with the truncated factorization formula, then summing over covariates. But now the problem is we don't measure Z2. We don't know these probabilities. So what are we supposed to do? So now we can just apply a little bit of magic and out comes the interventional distribution without Z2 on the right hand side. So what just happened here? So what we just did there was the result of this expression here. So this is the interventional distribution via the parents of the treatment. So on the left-hand side, we have the interventional distribution of Y given the intervention in X. And on the right-hand side, we just have observational distributions in terms of X, Y, and the parents of X. So the key insight here is we only need the parents of X to estimate its causal effect. And so so again, this is from the introduction by Pearl referenced down here. So that was a lot of information. So I'm just gonna try to recap some key points. The first is given a Markovian causal model with all the variables measured, we can use the truncated factorization formula to express any interventional distribution in terms of observational ones. And thus we can express any causal effect using our new formulation, the average treatment effect. The second key point is that if we have unmeasured confounders, we can always simplify the truncated factorization formula given a Markovian causal model to include only the parents of X. But now what if we can't measure the parents of X? And so what that brings up is this notion of alternative covariate selection. That's gonna be the topic of the next video in this series. So there we're gonna further explore this notion of simplifying the truncated factorization formula to only include variables that we measure, or in other words, to exclude the variables that we don't measure. And then we'll get further insight to the magic that we saw a couple slides ago. So there's there's a blog associated with this video. There's some details in there that I may have left out in this video. And I'll drop a friend link in the description so you can access the blog even if you're not a Medium member. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing this content. If you have questions, please share those in the comment section below. A big reason why I make these videos and write these blogs is for my own learning process and development. And the questions that I receive is a huge help in this whole learning process. And as always, thanks for your time and thanks for watching.